let's just still our hearts for a moment as we prepare to worship God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning as the one who removed the greatest barrier between God and us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, enable us to tear down artificial and human-made barriers that stop us from living and loving in accordance with your will. Amen. I welcome you in the name of that same Lord Jesus, the Lord who has called us into his presence, the Lord who walks with us and talks with us, if we are attentive to that same presence. And we begin our worship now as we listen to David playing the organ and follow the words on the screen of our first hymn, Lord for the years, number 470 in Singing the Faith. <laughs> And so as we come into God's presence, so now we pray as one body, as the children of God, some stay in this place, and the smaller children amongst us go to their own sessions now. 
We know, mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, that you are with us, whoever Ooh. and however we are, young and old, tall and small, and your Spirit goes with us in all that we do. And so we pray your blessing in this space and in the space where the children are about to go now, that you will be equally with us, one God in unity. Amen. George and Matthew Green. Looks good. Thank you. I think. Uh, oh. and so we continue our prayers. Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy to be part of the crowd, following behind others, not knowing what is taking place in front of us. Give us the power to make our way through the moving throng and the courage to touch you, to receive that life-transforming experience. But we also ask that you stop and turn around, that you call us by name, saying those words that make us know we are completely forgiven and un unconditionally loved. God of all, as a crowd, as a church, as a family, in this space and in other rooms in this building, in those spaces where people are watching online or watching on a different day, we come together and reach out today for your grace and for your healing. We pray for your help where we face challenges, for your guidance where we have barriers to overcome. And we pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. God of streets and God of the crowds of the world, we come to you in sorrow and shame for the times we have allowed prejudice to distance us from those you would draw us close to. So we ask that you raise us from our shame to love and to serve you and to serve them. We bring to you the times when we have been too proud to ask for help and too distracted to help others. Lord, draw us out of our distractions to love them, to be loved by you, and to serve you. We acknowledge the times when we have been quick to judge those we don't easily identify with. Those times when we've ignored those whose plight we have not taken to heart, who we struggle to have sympathy with. Lord, raise us up and open our hearts to seek your forgiveness to bless others with that same forgiveness and to open our hearts with those same open arms that you open your heart with in sacrificial love as we pray in your precious name, Lord Jesus. And as we pray these things, we know that your grace means that we can be assured of your forgiveness restored from all that hemorrhages out of our lives and brought to health and life in our relationship with you because you live us, love us and forgive us, Lord Jesus. And so as we give thanks that your healing ministry transcends all cultural and social barriers, we pray for a cleansing of all prejudice and for those whose illness or situation distances them from others. We pray especially for the mentally ill, the homeless, for refugees, and all on the fringes of society. May they, and all creation, know your healing and accepting love. And may we all reach out 
with that same love when and where we can. In your name. Amen. So we continue our worship now. As we hear our readings, the first from Lamentations, echoing the words that we began this worship with, and then from Mark's Gospel. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. They may yet be hope to give one's cheek to the smiter and to be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. And then from Mark's Gospel, we hear this wonderful story of contrasting characters and different situations, but the same Lord Jesus in the midst. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, she had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came to the leader's house, from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, 
Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. As we think about that story and those two differing accounts, we also hark back to the words of Lamentations as we sing in our hearts, but also watch the words on the screen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Number 66 from Singing the Faith. As we remember the words of Lamentations, one particular verse stood out to me. It's 29. Although we think of all the words that we've just heard in the song that we've just heard, then that verse says, to put one's mouth to the dust. And then it brackets, it says, there may yet be hope to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope. And in the stories that we've just heard from Mark's Gospel, we hear of two people literally prostrating themselves before the Lord, putting their face to the dust. One is saying there may yet be hope and the other is in the face of the realization that they have already experienced hope beyond hope. Jairus when 
he is asking and the woman when she has been healed. Two completely different characters. Jairus is odd in his behavior. He's a leader of the synagogue, a fine, upstanding man. Somebody who would have probably been associated more with those who would taunt and test Jesus than those who would be going actively seeking out his help. And yet, in his desperation, that is exactly what he does. No matter what others may ask of him, he steps out of his position and goes and begs. And the thing with Jairus is that in his position, he should really have sent somebody else. Not gone himself, but sent somebody else to do it in order to bring this rabbi to him. Because after all, he is the leader of the synagogue. And he should be bringing Jesus to him, not going to Jesus. And yet he puts all of that aside and he goes to Jesus and he puts his face in the dust. He kneels before him and begs for help because he knows nothing else that he can do. With all his faith, with all his religiosity, with all of the trappings that he has around him, he is desperate and he throws himself before Jesus. And on the way, they encounter a woman. And we've met this woman before. We're going to hear and see some words now, which will remind us, not necessarily bang up to date, because it's a couple of decades at least old now, what we're about to see. But it tells us a familiar story that we all know, and I think most of us love. So if you can have the video clip. Others have potted to the same length. <laughs> well, 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 well. Sissy! <laughs> Has it seen you at the doctor's? Well, yes. Is it the old trouble? What trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Woman's trouble. <laughs> Last year, when you said you were, you might have to have a hysterical rectum. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's not that. No, that clear the fact of the manipulation. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mind you, I don't feel very well. In fact, if I put my mind to it, I could be very ill indeed. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not me I've come about, actually. I've come on behalf of men. Oh, certainly God, what's up with the lad? Well, it's his Veruca. <laughs> you know he's got a very big one. How <laughs> soon? I mean, he can hardly get his shoe on for it. <laughs> Has he tried to get his trousers down his sock? <laughs> But too painful to do anything like that. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know what to do with it. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's all he could do. I mean, he couldn't hop down here, you know. I'm not surprised. That's why I've, I've come to see if Dr. Patel can give something for him. Well, I don't see why not. I've got a lot of faith in Dr. Patel. In the just come from Bombay. Is <laughs> a chipati, you know. <laughs> because the same for me when I came about my bird. I told him exactly what was wrong with my bird. Oh. What did he give you? His deepest sympathy. <laughs> Not surprised, knowing you're Bert, you deserve all the sympathy you can get. I mean, what? Right. 
I, I wasn't quite sure whether you were uh, wanting the whole of the seven minutes of that, but uh, I suspect you probably were. But this woman had women's problems. And actually, it wasn't a laughing matter. Twelve years with everything that she suffered with is something that nobody would wish to go through. You get the impression, just as we do with the stories of refugees spending thousands of pounds and putting their life at risk, that she was at her wit's end, as indeed they are, when we look at them sometimes disparagingly as they try to come into this country. She was as desperate. She tried everything, every single doctor's remedy, and I suspect every quack remedy, and all of that. And not only had she suffered all that she had suffered physically, but she suffered the shame, which is why I played the clip, because it's unmentionable, isn't it? Women's problems. In polite society, in our society, it's something that we still to struggle to talk about. In her society, it was definitely marking her continually being unclean out of everything that was acceptable in society. And yet this woman comes in desperation and hoping beyond hope and in her own way, living with those words in brackets that we heard from Lamentations, there may yet be hope. And I wonder sometimes how many people live with that and then feel, I suspect, as this story implies, that they don't even dare ask God for help because they are so full of shame that they are not worthy. And yet, she has the courage and the audacity to even if she doesn't ask, to take his help, to touch his garment, in the hope that some of all the wonder of who he is will in some way rub off on her. And her hope lies not in her worthiness to be given his help, but just that some of this miraculous healer's power rubs off on her and that she finds her healing there and wonder of wonders it does and then when he turns recognizing what has happened when he asks who has done this she then has the sense that he might at least acknowledge her because after all, he has healed her and she prostrates herself on the ground just as Jairus did when he had the confidence but also the humility that he could do such a, such a thing. She then realized that she had grace in her life and that even she might be able to prostrate herself in the same way that Jairus just has done. The thing that I find really amazing about this story is of such people who live in shame and don't think they are worthy of God's love. They don't even bother to trouble God face to face. They don't pray. Sometimes if they're people that you know, they might stop you in the middle of a conversation or even in passing on the street if they don't know you well and say can you say a prayer for me and if we have any relationship with Jesus we know that he would rather hear it from them themselves but they don't think that they are worthy they don't think that they are capable of speaking to the Lord of all creation to ask for the little thing the unimportant thing in all of the world that they need. And that's what I find amazing about this story, 
is that people who don't think they are worthy don't think in his busyness that God or Jesus can bother with them. And so this story has about it a sense of something which just happens along the way. Something that is in that in-between time of God in Jesus going from one thing to another and then something just happening as a side issue. But something which transforms somebody's life nonetheless. And so if it's you, believe that God can heal you of what grieves you, of what shames you of what causes you to hide in the shadows and not speak up and certainly not speak to him. And if it's somebody you know, or even maybe not somebody that you know, but somebody that you just meet, just let them know that with all the things that are facing this world, with the pandemic, with all the lives that have been lost in Brazil, with all that's happened in Miami in these last few days, with all the turmoil around in Batley because of the by-election that's coming up, that God still has time for them in the midst of all of that. That he may have lots to do, but there is still that by-the-way God who sees the smallness of our needs in the world's eyes, but the enormity of it in our lives. And by the touch of the edge of his garment, we are healed, made whole, and brought to the fullness that he alone can bring and that he has always desired from us right from the before the moment in which we were conceived and right beyond the moment in which we die. Because he desires that for us in the whole of our lives. When we want even a figment in our parents' imagination and when we are brought into the fullness of his glory in the resurrection power of Jesus and in those small moments in between where we dare to hope, where we dare to believe that there can be something better, and where we can dare to believe that even we can be touched by the grace of God. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. It is new every morning. Amen. So as we move on in our prayers, as we pray together, then to the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, we imp import God's presence into us and into the world by saying, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Living God, in our prayers, we bring to you those who are desperate for help, and those who take great risks in their search for healing. We ask your blessing on those who transcend political and cultural barriers to take aid and medical care to those in greatest need. Organizations such as Médecins Sans Frontières and Christian Aid and so many others we could list. All those who work in war zones across the world, reaching out to the hungry, the traumatized, the displaced. Lord, break down the barriers that we put up. Turn obstacles into opportunities and touch those who are in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I mean, God, we give thanks for the best work of social media that which brings into our homes the lives, lives and faces in the crowd, that draws us closer to them and their concerns. 
We pray for reporters who risk their lives to bring us news, for photographers, camera and sound operators. We pray for more opportunities for people's stories to be shared and heard. Real people's stories, real injustices that need to be highlighted and positive change that needs to be celebrated. We pray in particular in this time for those people who are still searching with hope, their faces to the dust around the building in Miami, the lives which have been lost and the people who have loved them, those whose lives will never be the same. We pray with the appeal that will be going out tomorrow of all those who in their desperation turn to people who make money out of transporting lives across cruel seas. And although we may be suspicious sometimes of their motives, we also know that their desperation indicates that we can never understand their circumstances. And Lord, this week, as the new £50 note enters circulation, we remember Alan Turing and how badly he was treated despite all that he had done for his country. And we pray for the families of all those pardoned posthumously and for an end to human injustice. And as we pray this, Lord, we pray for the work of the Methodist Conference this week as it seeks to answer some of those questions in the way we live out our lives in marriage and relationships and amongst the communities in which we serve. Lord, break down the barriers we put up, turn obstacles into opportunities, and touch those in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, we pray for those who fear that help will come too late, for all who have lost hope, for those who have lost livelihoods, homes, and loved ones, we pray for those waiting for hospital treatment, for transplants, for a diagnosis. We pray especially for children who are seriously ill and for their families. We pray to those applying for citizenship, especially those waiting to hear if they will be sent back to countries they have fled from. We pray for those in relationships where the person that they love the most struggles even to remember them. And we continue to pray for all who make decisions about budgets, those who analyze data, those who decide policy, those who have the power to prioritize who is, is helped first and who must wait. And for those around the world, political leaders, scientists and medical staff alike, struggling to contain fresh COVID outbreaks. Lord, break down the barriers we put up, turn obstacles into opportunities, and touch those in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, we pray for the church and for one another, that we would reach out across the barriers of culture and creed with faithfulness and integrity. We pray in this week, as Methodist Conference meets, for the new President and Vice President of Conference, the Reverend Sonia Hicks and Barbara Easton. We pray for all of those who will be received into full connection this morning and whose ordinations will take place this afternoon. We hold in prayer all 21 of them and we also hold in prayer all of the 76 who in this week are seeking permission to sit down, to retire as ministers. And we pray for all those churches receiving new ministers in this coming September, and those who will be covering the gaps. And with the news of the last few days, we also pray for those churches in Canada that have recently been burnt down and the tensions that there are around that society and the reasons behind all of that. 
Help us to reach out to you in prayer for guidance, for strength, for wisdom, and to reach out to one another as we journey together in Jesus' name. Lord, break down the barriers we put up, turn obstacles into opportunities, and touch those in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we pray with one voice, as your body, Lord Jesus, so we pray now with the words that you taught your disciples when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so, as we contemplate all that we've just prayed and all that we've heard, and all the people's lives that we have had cross our minds, and as we prepare to enter into this time of communion, we hear the words and we sing in our hearts, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. Or rather, we don't hear the words. We, we see the words on the screen. Uh, it's just music, uh, but it's some brass band I've just remembered. Lord, we come, we come, I come before your throne of grace. <laughs> come to our moment of communion. For those of us gathered in this place, hopefully you've all got a small cup uh, like this with a clear foil on the top covering the wafer and a red foil underneath that which is covering the wine. So at the moment of direction then we will peel back each of those in turn. And for those of us who are not in this place and not in this time, then my prayer is that you find whatever blessing is appropriate to your circumstances through what we are about to share together, and that you are included in communion with all of us gathered here. 
And so, Lord Jesus, as we gather in this moment, in this time, we remember that as John reminds us at the beginning of his gospel, and that as Genesis reminds us at the very dawn of creation, that you are the living word, God's spoken and living and creative power through all creation. And yet with all the wonder of all that you are, and all the amazement that we have at the universe around us, and that people have always had, even from the very earliest dawn of time, We have thought we have known better. We've turned away from your guidance, from your loving care, and made decisions of our own that have not always been helpful to us, harmful to others, and have harmed our relationship with you. And time and time again, you send your prophets Time and time again, you have sent those actors in the world who may not have been who we called for, but may have been in the right time and place who we needed. And so we have those words that we heard from Lamentations earlier, of terrible things that have happened in the lives of your people, and yet a struggle to turn back to you. so to call us even closer and to welcome us with your arms of love we sent Jesus Jesus who we hear in Mark's gospel calms the storm Jesus who we hear in Mark's gospel goes to a place where people of his own religion do not live who keep pigs and drives out the demon possesses possession of the man who he encounters there, who then finds himself with a synagogue leader laid before him and a woman too scared even to announce her arrival, just touching his cloak and bringing healing and life renewed into the lives of a mature woman and a young girl. And then we hear of Jesus being rejected on his return to Nazareth. And we know that that's our story too, Lord. That we cry out to you readily when we most need you, but we pretend that you're not there when we think we can do things our own way. And so, Lord, in all that you brought... And in all that you offer, you gave most of yourself on the cross. That we might find ourselves, as we do now, at the foot of your cross, relying on you for our health and our salvation. And knowing that beyond the cross, through your grace, you call us to forgiveness and to rise with you in new life, in new beginnings, and of the slate white clean, of shame washed away. And so we remember that on the night when you were betrayed, that you took a loaf, that you broke bread after giving thanks to your Father, and said, this is my body that is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, you took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, together, we peel back the first film. As though we were peeling back the cover of the guilt of our lives. And we take the wafer, knowing that Jesus, 
gave of himself for us, and we place it in our mouths with reverence and thankfulness, knowing that because of his grace, we are healed. Also, we peel back the second film. Just as we remember the accounts in the Gospels of the temple curtain being torn into, ripped asunder, and the veil between the Holy of Holies and the whole of creation being taken away, and know that by the cup of salvation we are brought into the fullness of the presence of God, and that same grace poured out into our lives, just as it poured out of the Holy of Holies into the whole world. He calls us to receive to full and overflowing, that it may spill out into the lives of those around us, that they too may be touched by the hem of his garment. And so together, and through his Spirit, we drink the cup of our salvation. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. The Lord is my portion, portion, says my soul. Therefore, we will hope in him. In the stillness of this moment, we put our mouths to the dust, knowing that there may yet be hope. And in the fullness of this moment, we raise our eyes to behold our Lord and follow his command to take all that we have received out to those who have need, in his name. Amen. Conclude our worship with the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Faithfulness.
Lord, as we head into a new week, help us to be people who choose to stand out from the crowd rather than simply follow it. By the power of your Spirit, help us also to step out of our comfort zones and give us the courage to challenge barriers that confine or constrain or control us. And do all of that in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.